Hello everyone and welcome back to ATA The Classified. Today we're going to have a very special interview with brand manager on licensing and publishing Anouk Bachmann. Throughout the interview and thanks to the questions we collected from our community, we're going to discuss the Assassin's Creed novels and comics with Anouk, going into details about topics like the Trident of Eden, Project Phoenix and the instruments of the First Will. All that and more on ATA The Classified. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to ATA The Classified. I'm your host, Marco, and today we're going to have a very special episode before we maybe go back to our standard episodes. Uh, more about that in the future. But as I said, today we're going to have a very special episode because we're going to have an interview, a chat with none other than the Assassin's Creed brand manager on licensing and publishing, Anouk Bachmann. Welcome to the podcast, Anouk. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm so happy too, because we have a lot of questions by our fans and um, by us in the team as well. So um, a word of advice before we start with the interview. Uh, spoiler alert, we're going to go full spoiler. Uh, to up until at least the the third issue of Assassin's Creed Uprising, right, Anouk? Yes, at least. At least. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Anouk, uh, I'd like to, uh, before we get into the interview, uh, can you please introduce yourself to our fans that might not know about you and your job for the AC franchise? Yeah, sure. Um, you're giving me a lot of honor by inviting me for this podcast. I'm super happy <laughs> to be here, first of all. Uh, so basically, I think a lot of our fans and people listening to this podcast, they already know uh, Amor um, and uh, who I work with. I work on his team and I'm in charge of, of publishing mostly. Um, so anything that has to do with uh, art books, comic books, novels, uh, anything that comes out in print... Uh, no. that's my business really so you you take care also uh, you work on the novels and the comic books but also on the art books right you have work. yes yes anything anything that's in print anything, anything in print. Uh, yeah so there's also some some like uh, uh, history history books that we did with uh, scholastic and yeah uh, there's 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 some history books that we did with scholastic there is the young adult novels uh, yes. there the novelization of the movie, um, the novels of games, uh, all the comic series. Uh, that that's all part of uh, part of what I do. That's a lot of stuff. I mean, can you yes. really <laughs> take care of that? Uh, like, can you really uh, follow all of that at the same time? Uh, well, I'm not alone, of course, because ah. for for every every project, we have writers, artists. Uh, we often work with partners like Titan Comics and Scholastic uh, Penguin Novels as well, and we work with their editors. Uh, I have my colleagues here who always help me, so I'm most definitely not handling it alone. But yes, it does feel sometimes I'm spinning a lot of plates, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I really don't want to drop any. <laughs> and there's more and more, but it's 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 a lot of fun. So it's. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just surrounded by really good people, by a really great team. So I'm not so worried about that. So speaking about um, you being surrounded by uh, talented people that work on the Assassin's Creed uh, franchise, we have a question, like a general question by our fan Claudio, who asks, uh, I would like to know what is Anouk's greatest source of pride working on the franchise? <laughs> Uh, hi, Claudio. I, I know Claudio from social media yeah. as well. So uh, I just wanted to say hi. Um, yeah, I'm super proud of working with with the people that I that I work with. It's uh, some of the artists, uh, the writers, uh, but also the team here on the floor, like people like Amar, um, my colleague Antoine, uh, people like Maxime Durand, our in-house historian. Uh, everybody brings something different. Uh, to the table, and everybody has has different skills, different insights, different expertise, and uh, I think there there's a saying 
that you should always surround yourself by people that are more talented and better than you are. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that's, you know, I, I, I feel that's really, really true for me. Like I like to surround myself and work and collaborate with people who I really admire and who have something that maybe I'm a little jealous of, but, uh, you know, rather than try to try to, you know, do more and be more, I just collaborate with them yeah. and, and grow better myself. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> but it also comes, that's also the same for our fans though, because, you know, when I, when I saw this question, I was also thinking, what am I really proud of? And part of it is, and this is going to sound cheesy, but it's, it's, it's you guys, it's the fans. <laughs> and it's, uh, I mean, it's cheesy, but it's true because if, if you ask me, like what, what is the most meaningful part of my job? It's, it's that I get to contribute to offering people a platform like uh, Assassin's Creed. It's, it's like a medium for other people to connect with each other and to be inspired by. And like people, to, they create fan art, fan stories. Uh, people like, you know, Access the Animus, <laughs> who like you guys develop friendships with each other through uh, Assassin's Creed. And I think my job with the comic and everything is, is contributing to that. And I think that's, that's probably the most meaningful part. And like something that I will always look back at with a lot of pride. pride. <laughs> and speaking of, uh, you mentioned uh, fans and fan art. Um, does fan art influence your work? For example, we have seen recently fans uh, and fan artists like Double Leaf, Sunset Again, Valeria Favoccia. Uh, they are working directly on their comics and we're going to have some interview with them uh, as well. So uh, do uh, does fan art and uh, fan influence directly your work? Or uh, Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and um, most... Uh... More recently, it's it's becoming more and more uh, dominant because through social media, we see Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we see a way for us, you know, people like me, brand managers and um, people that work in production to directly be influenced by fans, by their art, by their ideas. And um, where it's, I think before social media, it wasn't so always so visible. We would yeah. get letters or emails but but now it's it's immediate and it's direct and uh i think for double leaf sunset and and also valeria uh all of them i i found them and i saw them because other people would would link their art to me or uh, you know point it out to me or i would see it shared on uh, the assassin's creed channels or by other fans like you guys would share something yeah. like a fan art and at some point the same artist names they keep coming over again, and you see them over the years. You see them improve, which is really special because um, Double Leaf and Sunset and Valeria they have been around for a long time, and they've been doing fan art for a long time. Yeah, and we know that. Like we see that. It's uh, and uh, at some point with the comics, we have an opportunity where I, I kept seeing the same names coming over up, over and over again, and I got really impressed by the amount of progress. And I spoke to Amar. And also uh, Rafael Lacoste, our brand art director, and asked him, like, well, what, what do you think if we would ask uh, these fans if, if they you know, maybe could do a test for a comic cover or, or something like that? And, uh, and they were like, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really, really impressed with the quality of their work. And comics are a really great medium to give a platform for that. And um, Valeria, she's, she's doing the entire the, the complete interiors of the reflections mini series yes uh, and, and that's based on the work that she did for the covers of the locus mini series so you can see how from like some art that you see in social media you get uh asked for a cover and sometimes it can be some much more so yes long story short uh <laughs> fan art is, is for me it's an everyday influence wonderful and do you have a, any other kind of influences like uh, literary philosophical books anything else yeah uh yeah um my my background is in humanities and philosophy so when i when i studied i was personally very influenced by by a lot of different uh, philosophers and, and literature and uh, what's really cool is is that in Assassin's Creed you see Assassin's Creed is, is very deep 
as uh, in, in terms of its themes and stories are very, uh, very meaningful, very symbolic. And uh, I think just to give an example, working on the young adult novels with the writer Matthew Kirby, who is absolutely brilliant. Um, he was talking about genetic memories and, uh, you know, how there's more recently, there's more and more proof that genetic memories are, are very much a very real scientific phenomenon. And uh, we were talking about the philosophies of, of Carl Jung, who came up with the uh, term collective unconscious, like the whole idea that, uh, you know, what we see as, as instincts, you know, like you're, some people are born with a fear of snakes or a fear of spiders. And yeah. it's not something that you learn. It's something that people are born with. They've never seen a snake in their life, but they're terrified. And yeah. some people are not born with that and uh, they don't have it. So the collective unconscious basically goes back mm -hmm. to what if these these instincts, these these fears, that basic fears, basic instincts that we have, um, they're part of this, this genetic memory. Like they're, they come from so, it's like from the root of our civilization, the root of our humanity. And uh, so we were having a discussion about that, which is which is really always so much fun to to think about because it's you go off the deep end very easily. Yeah. And um, in the young adult novel, that you see that collective unconscious is a real is a real big thing because the big question is, of course, why is a group of teenagers seemingly randomly coming together to to solve this big uh, this big challenge, this big fight, like fighting the the, the trident of Eden. Uh, challenging the big yeah, the villains, so to say, Isaiah. Yeah. And um, in book three, we really unwrap that uh, collective unconscious. Book three is coming out at uh, the end of 2017 uh, yeah. and in some other territories early 2018. But in book three, you really see that collective unconscious as, as a reason behind why, why this coming together is, is maybe not such a coincidence at all. And... Uh, perhaps even something that's influenced by the isu uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun and yeah, i can wait in terms to read of that <laughs> yeah it's it's uh, matthew is is absolutely brilliant and uh it's yeah book three is going to blow you away for sure <laughs> um some other influences like you see uh, a lot of borges uh influences in in comics so at some point in i think it's issue three oh, that charlotte yeah. It's mentioned. Charlotte is actually, yeah, she's quoting The Circular Ruins, a short story by uh, Jorge Luis Borges, Argentinian author who wrote a series of short stories collected in uh, a book called Labyrinth, something that has personally influenced me a lot in my life, but also that comes back in Assassin's Creed as a theme because The Circular Ruins, she quotes that story as in, okay, so, so think about it, right? So if you're in the Animus, and you're experiencing the memories of your ancestor. And, but what if everything that you're living right now are the memories experienced by one of your descendants, right? Like, yeah, it's, 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 it's not necessarily, I mean, that's not necessarily what's happening to Charlotte, but it's it definitely, you can imagine that if you experience the animus and genetic memories over and over again, and especially in her case of different ancestors in different times, like what makes you so sure that everything that you're experiencing is real? Yeah. And uh, that's it's, a real mind bender. Yeah, it's a <laughs> nice know? concept. Have you guys ever thought of using such thing in in AC? Like, has it ever um, been thought at some point? Oh, it's 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 absolutely. It's not nothing about this is new, right? I mean, of yeah. course, this this concept of like what is reality and what is is real and and questioning our own reality is is something that has uh, been the subject of philosophers for many many thousands of years, but. Uh, yes, for AC, of, of course, it's something that that is on our minds, and uh, it's a theme. I think definitely as a as a theme that that's going to keep running, right? The idea of like what what is what is the reality, and also what is the validity of of memories, because memories are inherently subjective, and the only way to experience your genetic memories is through the subjectivity of your ancestor. So, um, I mean, even though what you're experiencing is their very real memories. Uh, you're still seeing them from their point of view. Yeah. So, you know, you, you can still question what are the right and wrong angles of history and if there is any kind of real angle 
that is true, right? Exactly. And that's kind of what the Templars and assassins are going at too. It's like it's, it's really a question of who is right and wrong because the you know memories and history are inherently subjective. There is no no real clear cut truth, and that thing that I think the assassins and Templars are experiencing with the Animus that that's that's something they have to face for themselves too. And Charlotte, she's experiencing memories of ancestors that you know one of them is a real asshole. You know. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, multiple of them even. Yeah. So what if you experience the memories of an ancestor that this is your bloodline and you ha you're being thrown in, forced into these memories of a person that you inherently dislike? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty harsh, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it was nice to see it in the, uh, in the Assassin's Creed comic series to see how she reacted to, to her ancestors. Yeah, and and even in the young adult book in in book three, and again, this is a little bit of a of a spoiler, but it's not too much of a spoiler. But what you'll see is is that you know Grace and David, the the, the siblings, they uh, they went through in book one, they went through the memories of of their ancestors during the New York draft riots, which is incredibly difficult yeah. and very because of the the racist events that happened uh, and that they had to experience and re-experience through their ancestors. And, uh, and at some point in book three, you'll see that, that, you know, they're, they're going to be confronted with the memories of an ancestor who had a slave. And in this case, it will be a Viking. And, uh, so, you know, again, it's, it's, I, I'm giving a heads up without spoiling the story, but you know, you're going to see that, that this is a real struggle because you see that, you know, we all have, uh, incredible large web of ancestors and and again the subjectivity of, of history is is becoming really challenging when you're confronted with that as as part of your bloodline yeah that, that's a really deep theme to to have even on a <laughs> young adult novel it's very interesting well that's it I, I don't think i don't think we need to and again talking to matthew who also works at a school and uh you guys should really chat to him as well at some point. yeah <laughs> like well, he's He's fascinating, and he also works at a school. And we were talking about this this age group of, of young adults and and what they could handle in terms of material, because indeed, like like I said, like book one deals with the New York draft riots, and that's one of it's a really dark chapter in history and um, what they can handle. And he said, "Oh, Jack, don't underestimate uh, this age group. Don't underestimate them. Like they can handle it." And uh, and I think I think he's right. You know, like it's, uh, I think these days, especially it's, it's, you know, the, the level of maturity that, yeah. that people work with is, uh, you know, we, we, we can't, like, we want them to rather grow up with this, uh, thinking about these things and making their own reflections. Yeah. Rather than ignore it and pretend that they can't handle it, which is dismissive. Okay. Uh, after this uh, set of general questions, um, uh... Uh, before we get into uh, the comics, which is the super hot stuff these days, um, <laughs> I'd like to delve a bit into the novels. And uh, um, I'd like to start uh, by asking you a question by, uh, a question by our fan Gilberto, who, uh, who asked, uh, what is the process of developing a novel for the AC series? How do you pitch and choose ideas? How many people work on the story before the, the book is actually written? Uh, this is this is also a good question because uh, some of our novels are uh, self-published and with some other novels we work uh, with partners. So yeah. uh, I think, you know, again, going back to the Young Adult series, we worked with Scholastic, who is uh, an absolute brilliant partner to work on uh, young adult novels. And... Um, Basically, you know, the, a partnership with them was was established uh, because we really wanted to do something for young adults, but also realized that this is an audience that we want to treat it with respect and yeah. with the right expertise and understanding of what this audience, uh, you know, is interested in also, but what they, what they can handle and the right editing process. So Scholastic has been an amazing partner for that. Uh, the editor we work with, Michael Petronik, has been really great to help us understand uh like what what kind of material is is appropriate and also pushing pushing this this audience you know young adults to um, to work with a brand that that was formerly really geared towards adults only yeah. uh, so I think, you know it was wonderful to work with a partner like that he he uh, proposed 
as uh, a scholastic proposal to, to work with uh, Matthew yeah. and uh, Matthew Kirby. Yep, yeah. And, after, you know, after they proposed us his name, I, I read some of the novels that he wrote independently and I felt like he would be a really great fit. I discussed it, you know, with uh, among ourselves. Amor, of course, reviewed, reviewed it and... Um, then we uh, had a meeting in uh, New York at Scholastic offices to meet with Michael, with Matthew, uh, and some other people to sit around the table and share basically, okay, this is what we're expecting, this is what, what we want. And um, what, you know, under Amor's guidance, what we always do on Assassin's Creed, and I understand that this is pretty unique as a brand, yeah. is that we really like to ask the authors, whether it's Matthew or Christy Goldberg, uh, to come up with ideas like, okay, let's meet and you present us what you think you want to do. And um, without giving them many constraints, except for like, this is for Assassin's Creed. And we really like to just see what's what's in their minds, what, it, what they're specifically passionate about. And uh, they always come up, you know, people like Matthew and Christy, they, they, they're absolutely brilliant creative people. So they always come up with ideas that are surprising to us. And... Um, They'll propose us a very variety of ideas, and then we discuss it among ourselves. Like, okay, what would fit would fit best with the brand? Uh, what would be a really good opportunity to hook into the lore that we have? What haven't we done before? Yeah. And uh, and also, you know, what what's the story we want to tell? And uh, yeah, so, so it's 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 a really quite an open creative process, which I believe is is pretty special for our brand uh, that we really give them a lot of freedom and. Then after that, of course, like once you pick like a setting, you pick a character. We discuss in a in a meeting. Like we we often fly over an author here for two or three days to have like a real crash course brainstorm. Okay. Like this is the brand. These are our constraints because the animus, the way it functions, is not the easiest thing in the world to wrap your head around. Right? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of chat. Like, okay, you know, genetic memories, they, they get passed on, but like you can only experience the memories of your ancestor up to the point of conception, things like that. Those are rules that are quite challenging and you have to set. And then we basically set the sandbox for them to play in. Uh, they go back and then we go have a, a few months of back and forth, back and forth uh, on writing the book and, and uh, getting it done. So, but yes, I, I think... What is very satisfying is is that within Amar's team and within our brand, we have a lot of freedom. We uh, we don't really put so many boundaries on the people that we work with, other than the brand, you know, and and of yeah. course the rules. Uh, another question that, that has been asked uh, by our fans is uh, now that, that you described um, which is the process of development of a of a novel series. Uh, of a novel for the AC series, um, considering you have worked on so many of them, which is the book uh, that you think, this is a, que a question by our fan Don, which is the book that you uh, lean more towards for the highest reread value among the AC <laughs> ones, I believe? Uh, this is a really challenging question. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm a big avid reader, and I have a habit of of books that I'm passionate about. I reread them um, often two times, and I read the whole Song of Ice and Fire series, or what what people who just watch this series known as a Game of Thrones. But yeah. I read the series of of Song and Ice of Fire twice. So you know, these are five books right now, and they started you know just as an example of how i read but like <laughs> they started coming out like what is it almost a decade ago or something like that it's maybe more and i read them as they came out and then when book five came out a few years ago then uh before reading book five i reread all the other books and then read book five twice so <laughs> i read a lot and maybe a little obsessively and i find that when you read something the second time or sometimes even a third time you get a lot of different information and yeah. a different reflection from it so and i think i guess i hope that some of the books that we publish are, are can be like that too like you read them the first time as uh, like a joy ride you know you ride the roller coaster uh like oh, oh i don't know what's happening and just yeah. you, you know, and then you just enjoy it and then the second time you read it and trying to connect all the dots and all the links and maybe yeah. 
you know, what I hope is, what I really would like uh, to see, you know, what I, I love hearing is that people who read, for instance, uh, whether it's young adult novels or heresy uh, yeah. about of arc or, or, you know, the secret crusade, that they stop reading for a little bit, they go and do some research on the historical time period and the historical characters and then go back to reading because now they have a better understanding of, of you know, what this character represents and maybe the reasons why we we present a certain character with a certain personality. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that's the case, you know, because I know that when I read a lot of novels uh, uh, or Lord of the Rings, you know, I often go to the fan wiki and read backgrounds and things like that. Like uh, look, look on the forums and then go back into the book and then you have a different perspective. So, yeah. but then I, again, I, I, get, I get a little bit obsessive with literature. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I'd expect... Um, I expect many fans uh, uh, might keep the wiki, the AC wiki, uh, on their side while they're reading uh, the books. Uh, I mean, I would do that, yeah. or, or I, I would at least go back. Like I read Heresy in uh, November, December of last year, mm -hmm. and it was so packed with uh, with information and uh, like new information uh, yeah. that. Going back to it, I would say that having the wikia on the side to check all the all the characters or the new characters and the old ones, uh, it's like it doubles the experience. It like it deepens the experience. Uh, yeah, I really love it. Like whether it's Reddit or the, the wikia or the fan or Wikipedia, I, I also have the AC wikia open at all times on my desktop. <laughs> Like I'm not lying. I told Philip that uh, who is who's managing the wiki yeah. when he, he came over to our studio. And I was like, "Oh my god, dude, you helped me so much. <laughs> Am I doing my job? Because there is there is so much. And thank God for fans like you know Philip who's managing the wiki and yeah. you guys writing these articles because I refer back to them too. Yeah, I'm, so I'm yeah. pretty sure uh, a lot of fans are so grateful to uh to, for, to towards Philips and the guys at the week here for all the yeah. wonderful job they're doing because it's 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 crazy like i, I and yeah. they're so fast it's like a book comes out and it's like a few hours later there's something new on the week and it just blows my mind because i i haven't even digested what's happening yet you know <laughs> 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 it's yeah it's kind of amazing yeah but uh but yeah i, I think it, like i see it um, I'm, what i'm hoping for is that the novels can provide both like okay you know like uh you're just relaxing uh, in a cafe or you're lying in bed and you're reading and just going on for the ride uh or you know have a full like multimedia experience where you have your ipad open with the wiki and something yeah. else with the wikipedia or historical websites and um so um we have uh, a few more uh, uh, more specific questions about e events that happened in the novels that uh we'd like to ask you uh so uh, the, the, the first question is uh, about the young adult novels. Uh, it's very specific. Uh, can, you, uh, can you tell us a bit how does the, how does the Trident of Eden work and uh, its role in the story of the novels? Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, so the Trident of Eden is is a new piece of Eden that we introduced uh, in the young adult novels, and uh, this this came from Matthew as well, like uh, from from our discussions with Matthew um, and Amar on like, okay, um, you know, what is what is at stake here? And uh, a Trident, of course, is a very symbolic symbolic weapon. Uh, you see it in many many different kinds of mythologies. Yeah. Uh, and different religions as, as a symbol and it's a very powerful symbol and in, in our case what we were thinking of is like okay so you know like d different different powers uh, like what, what kind of isu powers other than than pure weapons we could think of and so the prongs of the trident there are the three prongs of the trident the three daggers basically you can basically the idea is that they the trident consists of three daggers or three prongs that can be disconnected and used they're, they're daggers, but really their real power is is not um, the object itself, but it's what's behind them. So one of the daggers represents, inspires fear. Uh, one of them inspires faith and one of them devotion. And yeah. uh, when you think about it, it's like 
uh, fear, you know, like like when when the prong that inspires fear is used, uh, it, it basically makes you forces the victim or you know the subject it's used on, yeah, uh, to to see or envision their worst fear come true. Yeah, and now that to me is maybe a more powerful weapon than a sword. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. for sure, because it it. Like, I mean, that in your mind, right? Like, that's that's completely disabling. Yeah, um, uh, that's um, that's similar to how uh, in some of the games the apples were used. So that's how they are more the, the pieces of it are more powerful for their mind work instead of the yeah. physical attacks. That's... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like it's it's not so much a sharp dagger that, yeah. but it's it's the. It's what's behind it, and and if we, with the fear prong, like we, we would imagine that uh, indeed that that uh, some of uh, like some of you know not just one, but like some of the Mongolian Khans would have had this in their possession. Yeah. Uh, and then historically, it makes sense, right? Because um, they they raid it through uh, Mongolia and and yeah. what is now China, and with such a level of ferocity and inspired a level of fear that. It's become legendary today, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course. like, it's it's just a next level of of, of fear. And um, then another prong, like the one that inspires faith, you see that it's is used by in, in the novel. We, we give an example by uh, Hernan Cortez, yeah. who used it um, as a conquistador in uh, with this the Spanish. Yeah. Um, with the Spanish con- conquistadors, and you can see indeed that. Now, even even though one of one of the Incan warriors, he's trying to not have his mind bend to this. Like he, he can't he can't help it. Yeah, that, that's in the first uh, simulation yeah. in the first book. Yeah, it's it's the yeah. very first one exactly. Yeah. It's the very first scene, and you can see the power of that because you know inspiring fear is one thing, but inspiring faith in in some ways could even be equally, even not, if not more powerful. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, it's and. Uh, I- and Devotion is the same thing. It's, it's like the, the dagger of, of devotion. It's like what devotion is really like what what inspires someone to to follow and to be loyal. Yeah. Uh, like you can raise an army with that. And that's uh, something you'll, you'll see in the third book as well is, okay. is uh, among, among the Vikings, because there will be Vikings. But yeah. you also see people who are resistant to that. You'll see a very special ancestor who's resistant to this. Oh, and this is interesting. Yeah, so you can imagine also like because there are pieces of Eden and they they work you know especially the trident they work on a very very deep subconscious level. Yeah. But uh, resisting that then has is is a power in some way, right? Yeah. And so you'll see like okay, what what are the teens going to get from that? Yeah. Is so. is it is that going to be a sort of a reference to some of the first games in which the characters were able to somewhat resist? the apple's power uh we're not directly referencing okay. it but yes you could you could say that uh we, we definitely use the lore in a way to think okay these pieces of eden are in- insanely powerful uh if they can be used because not all not all humans can use uh, every piece of eden right because yeah. the pieces of Eden were designed by the isu to be used by them not okay. by us so it's it's not it's not the case that uh, every piece of Eden can't be used by every human. Um, like, you know, like, like some people, they, they can have a piece of Eden, but they don't know how to wield it or they can't control it. Yes. Like maybe some people can use it, but they can't quite control it. Like you see that even, even the, the sword of Eden, um, once it was deactivated in uh, the end of AC Unity, Yes. Uh, you know, and like Arno got it in his possession after Germain died, and it was yeah. deactivated. He couldn't, he couldn't reactivate it. Yeah, it's uh, you know, you can say that that these pieces are designed by by civilization uh, for themselves. That that wasn't wasn't quite human, right? So yes, of course. Uh, so they're not designed for us to use. So it makes sense that not everybody can use them, and then some some people might, some people might not, and. Maybe the reason they can or cannot use it is is part of their background, their bloodline. Okay, yeah, of course. Uh, that's uh, one of the hypotheses that the community always had. 
throughout time. It's, yeah, it, it is one of the hypotheses, and we're, we're not we're not giving. Uh, of course, you know, there's there's not necessarily a clear answer to like, okay, what exactly is it? But yes, I. Uh, you can see in the young adult novels for sure that the bloodline of the teens it, it matters in terms of uh, how they are affected by the trident. Okay, last questions about uh, specifically about the novels is uh, by our fan Sorosis on Twitter, who asks, uh, might we see an instruments of the first will uh, focus title like a novel or maybe a comic uh, focus directly on the on the instruments of the first will well i mean right now we have the instruments playing a very big role in the uprising comics yeah uh so i'm referring back to that because uh you know especially starting in, in issue three and, and issue four even more you'll see the instruments of the first will have become a very quite a powerful entity so uh they very much have a focus in the uprising series uh, there, you know, you, you even see that uh, starting in issue four, and um, you'll see like Templars and Assassins sitting at the same table. Oh, like wow! Yeah, this, I know this is a big deal. Yeah. They'll sit at the same <laughs> table to to decide like how are they, what are they going to do with these instruments? Because you know this is uh, this it's is a whole <laughs> different type of channel. Yeah. Yeah, this is big because like having Templars and Assassins sitting at the like trying to cooperate is is a theme that has been uh, uh, that the developers try to explore in a few games like in in Unity, yeah, for Unity. example. Yeah. So it's yeah. going to be nice to see a, a new take on that on the comic. Yeah, a more modern modern take as well. Yeah, as well. They... So the hardcore yeah, fans are going to be. Do, do you expect the the fans to like that kind of? Uh, approach the kind of imagery uh, yeah i mean of course i think it's it's uh it's very daring because uh, <laughs> to put a very well-known templar and some very well-known assassins at the same table without killing each other yeah. <laughs> i mean believe me they'll still want to kill each other yeah <laughs> but to refrain from that is uh i think it's gonna have some divisive reactions i hope it's gonna have some divisive reactions yeah. i hope I hope some people who are very passionately on one side or the other will uh, will be, uh, you know, having some pretty strong emotions about yeah. it. That's that's what I want, right? It's it's because these people are not supposed to sit at the same table together, but now yeah. there's this new this new challenge. This like uh, how do you say it? like a fifth column, the instance yeah. of the first column. You know, they may just not have a choice, yeah. and uh, it's going to be a it's gonna be eye twitching, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I have high expectations for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to the comics, like we we already started this. Um, we uh, one of the uh, the questions that was asked the most, um, and that's also about the novels as well. Uh, it was asked by our fan Claudia, by our fan Jerry Mind and Tomek. They always ask. Uh, are, uh, have there been any talks to close some story arc involving past characters? Uh, is, the, is there the chance that we'll see some loose ends tied up in the books or in the comic books? And especially uh, the character that is always named in this kind of questions is Connor. So can you uh, answer to such questions and requests? Uh, yeah, I, I think... I think it's a very good question. I don't really see things as, as loose ends. I think, you know, like these are entire lives and sometimes even generations that, you know, they, uh, we, we choose to tell, to tell part of their stories. And, and of course, there's always opportunities to then come back to other parts of their lives when we can. So we don't ever, as a brand, uh, as a team, we don't hesitate to bring characters back when we feel that they still have a role to play. Yeah. Or when there is an opportunity to um, to tell more of their story or a different side or even, you know, another part of their lives. Um, I think a good example was, like, at some point I was working on the miniseries, the comic miniseries of uh, Locus, based yeah. on the young adult novels. And uh, we were featuring uh, Tommy Grayling, uh, who yeah. was a, became a detective. He yes. was going to join Scotland Yard in London. And... Um, 
you know, we were still having him, we were still in the discussions of just having him solve the case. And then, uh, you know, one of our publishing managers in, in, in Paris and, and I were on the phone and we're like, oh, but, you know, he should, of course, he should go and join Evie and Henry yeah, there. Of course. <laughs> so, so they, you know, characters meet each other. And, um, you know, they meet famous historical characters. They meet each other. Uh, stories are never, you know, I, I think it's really hard to tell the full story of a lifetime in, in even a whole series of games. Like even for Ezio, he had three games, he had novels, and we're still, we still haven't finished telling his story yeah. because even at their issue of Reflections, we uh, tell the story of, um, you know, why did Mona Lisa has yeah. her smile? And well, of course, it's Ezio. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, you know, it's it's you know, there's there's always little little anecdotes of somebody's life to still to tell. So yeah. I don't think any any chapter is ever really closed, and I love that. And I think uh, you know, going back to Connor, what you know, the, the reflection series we've had um, Ezio, we told uh, a part of Darim's story, uh, the son of Altair, yes, and uh, Maria. And uh, we tell some of Edward's story and his friendship with Adi Valley. Yes. And yeah, the, the next issue will be Connor, but uh, which is, you know, of course, a very, it's, it's a glimpse of part of his life. And I think what is interesting to point out is, uh, okay, so I also worked on the Abstergo manual, uh, going back, yeah. the Abstergo manual. When, um, uh, while we worked on Unity, I worked with uh, Christy Golden, and inside editions, we produce yeah. that. And part of the Epsco manual is, uh, you know, you also see some PR leaflets in there, like yeah. uh, like some propaganda that Absurgo created around these famous assassins. Because, you know, our understanding is that that these famous assassins, like people, are publicly aware of them. And of course, Absurgo doesn't want them to be seen yeah. as as heroes or you know, any good at all. So. Like what you saw also in, in Black Flag is that Absurga has used the story of Edward and his memories to create new entertainment products. But um, once assassins have become a public awareness, and of course Absurga's propaganda machine wants to make them look bad. So yeah. there was a little little leaflet with some art of Andy, a comic artist Andy Belanger in there showing um, Connor as, as a really bitter, yeah. bitter, grumpy old man, you know, like yeah. left his family and this and that. And, but that's not true. <laughs> yeah, I, I've always That's, been wondering yeah. about that, like how to consider that information because it's propaganda. So uh, how can you consider that uh, true or false? Like the it was called but, something you, like you, the, the, yeah. sad, the sad story of Rather Nagadon. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, of course, that was done on purpose because this is an Abstergo publication. Yeah. So you have to read that through the eyes of Abstergo. And yeah. what about it is true or not? Or what is a real reflection of his life? Like, it's very questionable when, when it's an Abstergo publication on an assassin. So, you know, like, uh, so yeah, I, I, thought, I thought it was interesting because I think it, a lot of people adopted it as part of the lore. Yeah. Without wondering, like, wait, what is the source? And I think... This is really reflective uh, in a way. And I found this really symbolic because when people read history and it's symbolic and also of what is happening right now in modern political climate yeah. is say, when you get information, look at the source yes. and yes. question. And I think this is very important because you see all the false news and, you know, I won't go into politics right now, but, <laughs> but I think it's very, like, it's a reminder of people like when you get information and and it's it's interesting information that speaks to you like maybe check the source yeah always check the source <laughs> <laughs> always yes <laughs> so anyway i find that really 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 cool but yes uh, come back to the to the original question like like the story arcs and whether any famous assassins will come back is that yes of course they'll come back because <laughs> you know we, like their stories are i don't know when or where exactly for you know who will come back when but, yeah uh yeah, but, they're fascinating stories. Like their lives, like we're not done telling them. Okay, but we shall rest assured for, for, for that. But that when there is an opportunity to to tell more, then uh, and the opportunity is right, and it's an interesting story or part of anecdote of their lives, then yes, because we still have we have a lot of a lot of material to work with. Uh, okay, so moving on, uh, let's focus on uprising. 
um, which is like the, the, the hot topic right now. Uh, we have our fan, uh, Whale, asking uh, how much will uh, Assassin's Creed Uprising be continued? How many issues uh, will be released? Okay, so right now we're, we're um, dealing with monthly issues and the current, uh, the current story arc, uh, we're going well into uh, 2018. Wow. And yeah, I mean it's it's a big story. Eh? I mean, come on, it's it's like the stakes are really high. Yeah. And um we're taking this very very seriously and uh we have a very very important story to tell. We're dealing with the Phoenix project, we're dealing with Juno, we're dealing with the instruments. We're dealing with Otto Berg and Galena. Yeah. And you know, Charlotte's story like it's we have we have a lot a lot to tell still yeah. so um but then even even when that when that arc is finished we have no intention of of stopping you know oh. like there's like i said like there's no there's no final date to the comics okay good to know so um yeah. uh, you mentioned that uh this is uh the uprising is a series about uh among the other things about the phoenix project so uh, we have a tough question by our fan Ambra, who asks, uh, who says, I really love the comics and especially Uprising. The only thing I am a bit sad is that an, such an important topic like the Phoenix Project finds its conclusion in the comics and not in the games where it was started. Was it intentional since it was created in the games or is it a way to give... Uh, an explanation to plot holes or uh, loose ends that were left uh, from the past? Um, that, is, that is a good challenging question, but uh, <laughs> the thing is, like, I think is you should never see, I mean, I definitely we don't see the comics or the novels uh, or any, any other uh, media other than games as, as, a, as a fix or as a solution. Like, they're different media in their own rights, and I think... You know, in terms of what the potential of each media of each media is, is is medium rather is very different, right? So the level of character development, the level of exposure, the level of dialogue and visuals that you can achieve in a comic or a novel or a game or a movie is radically different between each of those mediums. Yeah. And so I think rather than comparing comparing them, I think you know, to, to, I think it's important to look at like, okay, wow. Like telling the story of the Phoenix projects, um, and, uh, you know, like, like more, get more exposure in Juno and the instruments through the comics gives an amazing opportunity to get a really wealth of visual information through, uh, the artist, brilliant, yeah. Jose Holter yeah. and writers that are amazing. And at the same time, like if you look at novels, uh, like the the level of depth you can reach in that as well. Yeah. Like it, it's no, of course it's they're they're different mediums from the games. Like the games are interactive. Um, they have other kind of stunning three D visuals, but I think you need to look at each medium as as having its own potential and its own power. Yeah. So thanks. yeah. So I, I don't I don't think you should see one as inferior to the other. Okay. Uh, so uh, delving a bit more into the plot of the of uprising, um, can you tell us or can you talk a bit about what Juno wants from the Phoenix Project and in general? Can you uh, clarify a bit more of the intention of Juno compared to the intention that Minerva had and that Consus had, considering? Uh, his messages uh, that was shown that were shown in the previous comic series. And this is a very good question because I, I think it's you know again it goes pretty deep into the lore. Uh, <laughs> Juno really despises humanity. She really really doesn't like us at all. And this all goes back to you know the human uprising. She's I, I don't think she's ever really had much respect for human beings since since the time of their creation, but um like her father was killed by humans yeah. and uh, this is something that you know we're, we're going you know issue four will be very interesting of oh. the of uprising like you know to will it, mention, still... will it mention her father that was mentioned in ac3 it'll more than mention that that's yeah. interesting it's a nice connection I... to the games yes to the yes to the... 
you know, basically in, in the comics, we wanted to also give a glimpse of the, like, what is one of the roots as to why Juno is so pissed off at us? And one of the main reasons is, you know, she, she's never liked us, but one of the main reasons is that the humans killed her father yeah. like this. And, and you'll, you'll get a glimpse of that in the next issue. And cool. I think it's going to be very, very interesting and satisfying to see. And it also makes makes it more understandable as to, like what where where does all this anger come from right that she yeah. has and obviously a lot of things have happened since then like she holds she holds us responsible for uh the toba catastrophe being ignored you know with like the solutions coming too late yeah and uh the issue uh being basically eradicated because of it right so she holds us responsible for all of this yeah so what she wants is is to use humans and you know here instruments that's why they're called the instruments uh as a tool to uh, to come back like she wants she wants to come back she, she's stuck now in the gray in the digital okay. networks right yeah. like she's stuck she needs she needs to have a a physical body to be able to to come back to be able to get her hands on pieces of eden which is where the koi nor comes in yeah uh and to basically regain her powers. And what she really wants is to just uh, reestablish herself as uh, as a god of being on Earth, yeah. uh, and... to rule over us, and to either see us as slaves or maybe just to wipe us out like, where we're not useful. Okay. And that's where, that's where her instruments come in hand. Like she, she, the way she sees the instruments is like, well, you know, you're either going to serve me or... You, or, you know, or you're going to die. Not so many choices. So, <laughs> right yeah, at the same time, the instruments are very willingly serving her because yeah. they too see us. Like, they, they, they too agree with her that humanity is, is not meant to lead itself. Like they're outside of the assassins, they're outside of the Templars, and that's why you see some Templars and assassins uh, defect to, uh, to the instruments because, you know, they get... They also got like brainwashed by by Juno and like okay, well maybe we were never intended to lead ourselves because after so many millennia of war and misery yeah. and infighting and fighting each other and death and sadness, like maybe maybe this we would be better off if you know like one one of the people who actually created us, like one of the entities who created us in the first place, should lead us. So it's you know you can. Like it, it's it's a bit, it's a bit uh, it's a bit harsh, but there you can understand it in a way. I think. Yeah, that, that's why so many characters might end up in the in their instruments. So that, yeah, because that's what it's, you, it, you know, especially if you've been a Templar or an assassin for many years, like the, the level of suffering and death yeah. and war, and the futility of fighting each other that you would have witnessed is uh, would have been pretty disillusioning. Another question that uh, we had, um, you mentioned the instruments of the first uh, wheel. Um, they took, uh, they finally t took an, an active role in the comics after yeah. uh, we, like, uh, as, uh, at least I uh, have been expecting them to take an active role for years now. So uh, can we expect something similar uh, by Juno, like an active role by Juno? Because the fans have been talking about this. Like Juno uh, has been scheming for years, but hasn't done uh, directly. hasn't had a, a, an active role. Can we expect something like that in the comics? Uh, she she already is active. I mean, she's stuck. She's stuck in the gray, and you know, she's she can only really get out through networks and influence through networks. But um, she's already active, and you can see her. Uh, even in, in Syndicate, you can see the extent of the influence that she already has over her instruments like Violet da Costa. And, yeah. uh, you know, she, she's, she's controlling, manipulating the instruments as if they're her puppets. And uh, so I, I, I think she's, she's been pretty active and becoming more active. And in the comics, you'll see her, uh, again, really steering towards, towards a big um, conclusion of that, yeah. For sure. Okay. I mean, it's uh, with. I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, yeah, Juno is really. She's really pissed off, and she's <laughs> really. She's really at the point of like, okay, you know, uh, right. The race is on, basically. Okay. Another question we had is um, 
the latest issue uh, it was um, when the assassins were looking for the coin or uh, I think Michelle mentioned that um, that Charlotte had to go into the animus to look for uh, a new ancestor uh, it was called uh, uh, Ignacio Cardona did I yeah, yeah I, I think yeah. it's Ina Ignacio Cardona I, I don't think I think if it was Cardona there would have been an uh, oh an uh, I don't know I'm not so sure <laughs> <laughs> Ignacio, for sure. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a bit about him, or shall we wait for the the upcoming issues? Uh, no, I, I can give you a heads up. Uh, see, see, there's a little exclus exclusivity. Oh, thank <laughs> he's, you. Uh, he's, 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 well, I mean, I'm not going to spoil anything. It's it's still going to be plenty to discover. But uh, yeah, Ignacio is is he's a Spanish assassin. He. Um, he fights on the side of the militants during the Spanish Civil War. So he's he's on the side of, he's in a group with mostly anarchists, but also communists. Because in the Spanish Civil War, it was the anarchists and the communists and, and, and militants between both sides that were fighting against the fascists under Franco. Now, yeah. he, he's part of that, you know, fighting against the fascists and... Um, you know, he's obviously when he joins them and his, his background, which we won't see, we won't see the complete story of his background, but his background is that he joined them indeed with, with a cause. He's an assassin. He, he fights for freedom. But so he's, he's logically on, on the side of the militants against the fascists. But um, and, you know, maybe more aligned with the anarchists than the communists in a way, but but still fighting on their side. And at some point, like, what we what we won't witness in the comics, but, but it's part of his backstory. It's like he was there at the bombing of Guernica in uh, yeah. 1937, I think it was, and this is one of you know one of the most tragic events uh, in in, uh, in in history. A lot of civilians died, and he was there. He witnessed that, and he he is a really he's become quite disillusioned by the time we meet him. Um, oh. He's he's pretty hardened. He's pretty disillusioned, and uh, he's not so sure what he's fighting for anymore. And at the same time, we see him in a period that the anarchists and the communists started to fight each other as well, which is, you know, where, where the Spanish Civil War really fell to pieces there. Yeah. Um, so we, we see him at this, this period of, of crossroads in, in the Spanish Civil War. It's really, uh, it's, it has a very deep political, complicated political background, but we see it through the eyes of an individual and... When I was working on this with um, Tom Williams, the editor at Titan Comics, and the writers Dan Waters and Alex Buck uh we were like, okay, because you only have so much space and, and room to visualize something as complicated as, as a setting as the Spanish Civil War. And uh, so we decided to all read uh, George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia. Yeah. Uh, because what's interesting is that George Orwell is, of course, a famous author in 1984. He was actually there. Um, oh. So, uh, and he wrote a lot of, uh, like, almost diary-style reports. And in a way, like, what you see in, in his novel, which is really a, a, a novel, a report, like, Homage to Catalonia, is you really see him, George Orwell, to start out writing quite hopeful, quite idealistic with a lot of principles. And at the end of that, yeah, he's been really beaten down with, with reality. And I think in a way, um, Ignacio's personality or what he's been through kind of reflects that. Oh. Um, so, you know, without being able to actually tell the, the entire story of the Spanish Civil War in, in a few pages in comics, there is a lot of, I hope, you know, there's a lot of depth to it. Thank you for giving this uh, snippet of information about about this character. We'll see how the community reacts to him. Is is he the yes. same assassin that is portrayed in one of the covers of uh, by Sunset again recently? Yes, yes, that's oh. him. Good to know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, last yeah, he's question. Very, very, yeah. very handsome guy. I'm quite, quite uh, very, very <laughs> have a little crush on him. Ah. <laughs> Okay, last questions about uh, Uprising. They are about Just a Dummy, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> um, recently you, telled, you told us and we shared it with our fans that uh, the rogue assassin from the first issue and th that appeared in the third issue of Uprising 
is just a dubbing, although it wasn't really uh, hinted through the text of the of the comics. No. Mm, even though uh, there are some visual connections uh, in a way that that. Uh, that um, between how it was portrayed in Brahman and how it's portrayed in Uprising. So uh, a, a question that came, us to, uh, came to our mind immediately is, can you tell us a bit more which are the motivations that pushed him to do what he did to shift sides? Because he, he really seemed uh, um, uh, believing in the creed, in the Assassin's Creed. So can you tell, yeah. can you tell us what happened? Yeah, it, it, it just deepened. Indeed, like I was surprised that nobody picked it up with their eagle vision that it was him, <laughs> which is why when I told you guys, I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but indeed, it wasn't it wasn't like the different styles of the comics as well because he appeared for the first time, of course, in Brahman, which is an absolutely brilliant comic, yeah, uh, graphic novel, really, and uh, so beautiful, so insanely beautiful. And uh, he appeared first in that, and uh, what you see. You know, in, in Brahman, is is uh, he reacts quite harsh. Like his 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 twin sister dies. Yes, and she's killed by the strike team that was sent in by Otto Berg. Yeah, and uh, he takes her her finger as like the last piece of genetic memory, and it basically immolates her body. Right, so to not leave any traces. Yeah. Uh, now, that's that's I I don't know. Like even though he believes in a cause, you're kind of like, wow, that's pretty that's pretty cold, eh? I yeah. mean, that's. That's a pretty messed up thing to be able to do that and yeah. kind of move on as like this assassin machine. So I think that yes, you, what what you see is is a very was a very idealistic. You no, know, assassin very strongly believed in the, in the cause, but also a little bit deranged. I mean, like that's uh, the way he acts. Like he's very cold. He's very very harsh. So I think. You know, like, look at that character when we were writing the comics. I'm like, I, I never really, I always wondered about this guy, you know, like, uh, about his, his psyche. Like, what, where yeah. is he at, this guy? Because that was, uh, that kind of, I found that a bit disturbing and in a good way, in an inter interesting way. Uh, how he acted in Ram. And like, it's, it's um, very interesting. Not, not even, I found it even a little bit similar to, to Otto Erg in a way. Like, yeah. he's become such a soldier, right? Like, it's kind of twisted. So when we were having these, these instruments of the first will and, and talking about like, you know, how, yeah, of course, some Templars deflect, defected to it, like uh, Violet de Costa. Clearly, Altenberg is not aware of that yet anyway. But, yeah. Um, and, but yeah, it, like, it, it could very well be that, that an assassin or even multiple, but probably not as many have, have been exposed to this too, which is his influence. And uh, just deep. Okay, so at some point, like w the last thing we hear of him is 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 through reports in Syndicate that in Syndicate, yeah, he's yeah he's he's sent to Australia to investigate the Phoenix Lab, yeah, and um, like he speaks out against you know getting initiates involved and whatnot. And he still seems to be on track. But what happened after that? You know, like what happens to a guy who's been through so much, who's been a soldier all his life, fighting for a cause? His twin sister is killed. Like yeah. he's he's been through so much. Like at some point, you could imagine that. Okay, let's let's suppose that maybe what, whatever he found in Australia, like maybe he did get exposed to Juno. Maybe he got exposed to the instruments. Maybe he mm -hmm. saw a different way. Okay. And do you plan I don't on showing it, that sorry. in the comics somehow? Uh, we we won't we won't be able to you know the story in the comics is, is really charles and galena's okay. and also on, on you know how they how they deal with it but uh we'll, we'll talk about it maybe you know i would love to show it one day but um but i don't find it hard to believe that that a man like that who's been through that like like become an assassin soldier who just lost his sister and then gets blatantly assigned to the next job yeah and then gets promised something more, something more meaningful, something, um, you know, by, by a godlike being like Juno. Uh, yeah. You know, like, like finally something that adds me real meaning to his life. Yeah, I could I could see that happen. OK, uh, we're going to have a very uh, quick segment because we found out uh, this was the first time uh, that we 
um, collected questions for an interview by, uh, from our fans. And we're sorry for that. But the funny thing that, uh, that came up was the amount of questions by colleagues and friends of yours. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> They troll me. <laughs> and and, and the, 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 the funny stuff is that they ask you about themselves, which... Is... <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> okay, would you like to answer like a very few questions like, um, from your colleagues and friends? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Live? Oh I hate them and I love them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first question out. is by a certain Amar Azaizia. Oh my God. <laughs> who asked what does Anouk really think about her infamous boss <laughs> okay uh, it's my boss right <laughs> so all, all, yeah, all positive it's, things it's it's <laughs> no I think, I think having having Amar uh, as a boss or you know it, it's I always I have a whole folder uh, in my pictures on my, on my desktop that's the, like a boss folder <laughs> so when he when he helps out or he makes a statement, I just send him one of the like a boss memes. Uh, yeah. that basically sums up like how I see it. Just things like a boss. It's like having your own in-house uh, Sun Tzu. Um like he gives me counsel. He oh. <laughs> uh, Yeah, it's 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 really, really good. Uh with with Emma as a boss, like I, I like to make decisions, to move things forward, um, and at the same time to guard the integrity of the brand yeah. is actually it's he makes my job easy. Yeah. Uh, like it, it's really, uh, and I'm not lying about that. It, it is <laughs> it is really amazing. And uh, because when whenever I'm stuck with something, and sometimes I have some really complicated issues, I'm stuck with. I have a meeting with him and. Like he kind of just maps it out and enables me to to make a decision and move forward and you know which is he he's the reason that we have so many things coming out uh, novels oh. comics uh, art books you know and that that we're able to do all these things oh. so yeah it's it's pretty damn cool to work with him. <laughs> Okay, another question is from Andrian. Uh, I hope I can pronounce that correct. Jibnijie, Andy. Uh, how? <laughs> question for Anouk. How can one become as cool as you? Asking for a friend. Okay, so uh, Andy, <laughs> Andy and I are, are on a bit of a workout challenge. How uh, are you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we 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 kind of uh, prop each other up with uh, how cool are we? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think you, you have you have to have a healthy dose of confidence, right? Like, yeah. Uh, no, honestly, like Andy, Andy has been a real inspiration for me, um, and uh, he worked so hard to get where he is, and he's yeah. so incredibly passionate passionate about Assassin's Creed and the work that he does, and his his life, uh, like he's such a positive, hardworking person that. Um, you know, for me, my, my personality can be pragmatic. I can be sarcastic or even cynical sometimes. And having a dose of Andy in my life is, <laughs> is really, really good. It's, he's like, he's like a positive force, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, and also we, we share Idris Elba pictures and oh. this is <laughs> for, for inspiration. And, yeah. That's some good is, inspiration. You know, it's important. It's important. <laughs> Uh, last question uh, from Raphael Lacoste. You mentioned him as the brand, uh, franchise brand uh, art director. And he <laughs> asked candidly, uh, how is it to work with Raphael Lacoste? And he tagged himself. <laughs> yeah, of course he did. Oh, the master, the maestro. Uh, Raph and I, we go way back. Uh, we started working together, I think it's about eight years ago now. And uh, yeah, yeah, about about eight years ago, and uh, so I think I've yeah I've, I've known him the longest, and uh, he's a real powerhouse when it comes to talent, and oh. um, like I mean, you see his art; it's yeah, it's not. I it's totally insane. agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I it's absolutely, uh, and it's it's always been such a joy to work with him because. You know, I never like like 
when I just started working on AC, uh, because I met him way before I started working on AC, and, and you know, I, I started like tackling that. I'm like, okay, how to work with uh, artists and art books, and how do, how do we do this? Because like all the concept art was all over the place, and uh, one of my missions uh, was to, uh, when I started working on AC, was to gather all the concept arts that were ever made yeah. in the highest resolution possible so we, that we could start making art books uh, and even, like, for instance, the complete visual history book. Yeah. Uh, but this was a massive challenge because a lot of this work is digital. Our artists are maybe not here anymore, didn't save their files. Like, it took about a year to do that. Yeah. And... Um, he was always so supportive, like uh, to understand my mission and to uh, work together to really propel the arts of Assassin's Creed forward in um, through things like art books, but also uh, what is it like museum exhibitions and oh, uh, yeah. you know shows, prints, and all these things. It's like, and he has he gathers a team of of the very best artists around him as well, like Martin de Chambeau, Jeff yeah. Simpson. It's uh, to see him and his team work is uh, like, it's astonishing. It goes back to the very first question of this podcast is what is, what is some of the greatest pride of, of yeah. your work is that like, I like to surround myself with people who are better at me at something, you know? And yeah. in this case, like, like, you know, surrounding myself with, uh, with Raphael and, and the people in his team, Martin, Jeff, uh like it's inspiring it's great <laughs> so i'm very lucky <laughs> and that's it for today's episode uh, anouk thank you so much for taking your time to be here with us and to answer the questions of our fan um would you like to add anything more uh before we wrap up uh i've been asked by my uh by my colleagues antoine and martin uh, to say how cool they are so oh, they're very yeah. cool <laughs> <laughs> they should have asked um, some other joking. questions uh no I, i'm i'm not just joking it's it's uh honestly like uh i've, I've had so much support i was a bit, a bit nervous to get on this podcast so really? it was really uh, really cool. yeah of course i, I mean it, to me because i'm so it's a real big honor for me like oh. i couldn't believe you guys asked me to to talk to you, you it's know? the same like, for us so it's <laughs> So when I asked, like, when I told my colleagues, like, I'm so nervous, and they're like, "Oh, just talk about how cool we are, and then I'll be okay." And, <laughs> and then you're, then that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be fine. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think I just, I just want to before we close, I just want to thank the fans. And uh, again, like, it makes my job so like every morning I come to my work with so much pleasure, uh, even before I've had coffee. Like, yeah. <laughs> It's it's so nice to come in and, and see people like you guys, uh, you know, Cirrhosis, Claudio, yeah. Jedi Mind post on Twitter new things about Assassin's Creed. Like, it's yeah. uh, again, it's exciting. It gives me energy, and thank you for being there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and would you like? Um, where can our fans uh, find you on social media to ask uh, other question about AC or anything else? Uh, Twitter, Twitter is the best way, I think. Yeah, you know, for 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 questions and all that. So, uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is uh, Valskuiken, which is the name of my old budgie, which means oh. nasty chick, nasty oh. chicken Dutch. <laughs> I mean, like like chickens and a little bird. But because um, I used to have a budgie that was really really mean. But um, <laughs> anyway, Valskuiken is a V A L S K U K U I K E N. Oh, all right. <laughs> and that's it for today's podcast. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Please let us know your opinions about what we discussed in the comments. We really want to know what you think about it. Also, as always, stay synchronized with us and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.